Good morning. My name is Yogendra. I'm from EA Technology Australia. I welcome you all to this seminar or webinar on expanding the EV charging infrastructure in New Zealand. Um, the other two presenters with me today, Peter Berry is Executive Director EEA New Zealand, and Ian Cooper is joining us. Ian Cooper is Head of Inno Innovation Delivery in EA Technology UK. So again, good morning everyone and welcome to the webinar. And we are just going to start now. So in today's webinar, we will be covering a few topics. Uh, first of all, Peter will introduce the topic and set the scene, especially in the New Zealand perspective. And then I will try to give another global trends in EV market, which is very interesting, fascinating at this point in time. And we will then have Ian from EA Technology UK to provide an overview of the charge project and also the demonstration of tools uh, which EA technology has been part of the development in working with several DNOs in UK. Uh, EA technology has been part of the electric nation trial, a uh, couple of other trials going on. So we will share some knowledge uh, from those learnings and the tools. Uh, and then I'll come back to you know, discuss how these learnings can be useful in New Zealand. And then we will have the Q&A session. I'll now request Peter Berry to introduce this. Thanks very much, uh, Yukendra. Kia ora koutou, uh, everyone, and a very good welcome to this uh, workshop. Um, it is an exciting time in the world and in New Zealand. Uh, decarbonisation is certainly leading the charge around all sorts of areas in terms of uh, transport and process heat. Um, and uh, it really is going to be uh, an exciting 30 years, 20, 25 years as we move uh, towards decarbonisation. Um, the future is electric, it certainly is. Uh, the New Zealand government is determined to uh, push decarbonisation and meet its goals from the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, and uh, this move to um, decarbonisation in New Zealand has certainly got a strong focus on um, demand response and um, uh, renewable energy um, generation. And a lot of this is going to be uh, connected to people's to, to the industry's distribution system. Because of the intermittent uh, nature of renewables, flexibility is going to be critical in terms of um, delivering uh, this particular future. Okay, as you can see, everybody talks about things happening in a step change, and that's very much the kind of scenario for New Zealand. What we are starting to see though is um, government policies being talked about. We have an election coming up shortly that will, not, will potentially impact upon other um, types of DER, photovoltaics, um, being put onto, uh, onto roofs and subsidised. But to service um, the, the changes in the transformation, the New Zealand power system needs to think differently and um, have some different approaches in terms of how it's going to manage uh, multiple flows and have a 100% decarbonised um, generation system. Um, this step um, is likely uh, to see a change in approach um, that brings customers along in this journey. They're going to be absolutely essential. If customers are not brought along and are not incentivised in terms of allowing their DER, EVs, etc., to be utilised to uh, maximise the, the value of uh, their load and also to enable us to manage the grid, then we're going to have all sorts of um, potential problems. So really customers are going to be a key in terms of the future power system. So what we need to do is bring together customers, technology and systems to make the change. And this is all new 
and in a sense we're all building the plane as we fly it. Do, uh, we've been doing pilot studies and, and this is just one example. Uh, we've also got the opportunity to learn from pilot studies coming from overseas uh, about what's happening, what the implications are of this upon, upon power systems. Um, the FlexTalk project, which I'll cover very briefly, is a joint EEA, ECA and industry project looking at the issue of common communication protocols for um, DER, uh, and with the case study being on um, uh, electric vehicles. Um, the FlexTalk um, project um, really is uh, looking at how we need to develop smarter coordination of DER to manage demand, how we build an increasingly smarter network um, to meet electrification needs, how we look at flexible capacity and how we deal with DER connections. These are all areas that are going to confront us in, in the coming decades. There is a significant uptake of electric vehicles in New Zealand, and this really offers the first opportunity to test some of the challenges and opportunities DER is going to pose to the, to the grid. Uh, I recently joined the band of uh, purchasing electric, an electric vehicle, and I've got to say, given that uh, petrol prices in New Zealand are at $3.20 at the moment in some places, I can see that demand for electric vehicles is only going to continue to grow quickly. With this growth being inevitable, it was part of the reason why EEA, in partnership with ECA, uh, were looking at developing this pilot study, FlexTour, for the energy industry, so we can look at testing communication protocols. The ones that we, the one we chose to test was OpenADR 2.0, and part of the reason for testing that is it's a, it's a uh, communication protocol which is being adopted elsewhere in the world. So we're likely to see product and systems that are going to be open ADR uh, enabled. So what we're doing is, um, is testing the use of the common communication protocol. And this is being delivered by determining the use case for flexibility services to be communicated and creating process maps for these. Assessing the advantages and limitations of open ADR Within, New Zealand, within the New Zealand context, including high-level comparisons against each of the other communication protocols that's out there. And of course, demonstrating interoperability of communication protocols between EDBs, flexibility providers, and consumers. This slide is just to highlight just to highlight that FlexTalk trials explore a market-led model, and this diagram outlines the high-level trial configurations. Um, if people want more information, um, at the end of this um, presentation, uh, the complete presentation, our contact details for um, uh, Connie Dunbar, who's our project uh, manager, and Stuart um, Johnson, who's our um, uh, lead advisor, engineering and technical. So where are we at with the FlexTalk project? Uh, this slide talks about the seven phases, and we are now four phases through of the seven phases. Uh, the first four phases dealt with um, part A, um, and this project is about to, um, to be completed. This is one-way communication uh, between uh, VTNs and VENs, and uh, that is the report is about is being drafted at, at the moment. And we'll be holding a separate uh, webinar to um, talk to the industry about the release and outcomes from our study in Part A. The project team is currently at um, protocol implementation and is focused on Part B and the v multiple um, communication links for VTN and VEN. It's important 
as we've been through this process that we're engaging stakeholders throughout the project phase. It's been critical in achieving the desired outcomes, namely identifying any issues with interoperability and develop, and we are developing guidance that will apply to all parts of the industry. The final report from FlexTalk is due in February 2024. So, part of the FlexTalk project has also been to think about and look at what's going on overseas. And uh, the purpose of that is to get some insights into um, implementing uh, open source protocols uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, looking at the type of information exchange that's going on, and the rationale and drivers behind the adoption standards of protocols in other jurisdictions. So there's a lot of work going on globally. We're all testing processes in New Zealand, and it's now my pleasure to hand back over to uh, Yagendra and Ian to talk to us about uh, the work that's happened in the United Kingdom in the area that the FlexTalk project is uh, looking into. So back to you, Yagendra, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for setting the scene. And New Zealand is definitely advancing for, towards the EV journey. Let me change this. So I will now present very quickly the globally and the global trends are not dissimilar to what Peter has presented. Uh, in terms of the IEA latest thing, you know, there are 26 million electric cars Basically, why I put this graph is visual. It tells very clearly that trend is exponential. Uh, I mean, you can see that. So I think that despite of different local conditions, political conditions, policies, and everything, one conclusion comes to my mind is that EVs have gone to a stage where they are unstoppable. It is coming, it is coming exponentially. Now, yes, some regions will be slower and a little bit slower and faster and all that, but there is nothing that we can deny that EVs are not going to take over. Um, I think from this graph, what we are seeing from 2012, 13, 14, when we were talking of which standard will survive CCS2 or CHEDIMO2 or what will happen, not everything is going and going further. Now, this is this is another thing which is now if the ev demand is growing that means the demand for the charging at home and public uh, will also grow and and the pressure will come on the electricity network uh, as peter said everything is electricity uh, heating processes uh, transport everything comes coming back to the electricity definitely the electricity are going to see the demand uh, the question is how optimally we are managing that now this particular you know information this particular information is about uh, that in terms of the how many charges we have per ev and you can see that you know new zealand is actually still you know like 90 um, you know one charger for 90 evs compared to the world standard which is like very low here and i'll come back to you why it is so and then this matrix is not certain because what happens is the societies like australia and new zealand where we have enough capacity for home charging the single dwellings um, we have seen this in australia the solar we have so much roof space that people are putting you know solar similar thing is happening here so definitely you know like there will be the how many charges we require, public charges we require uh, per EV will depend on the local conditions. But this is just a comparison globally. Um, you can see the third spot is Australia. Uh, and then there is the United States, China, below there, world standards. So I think the another comparison which you see this dots, and they are basically saying, okay, if not, how many charges are there? What is the 
capacity of charging installed per EV. And you can see that, you know, New Zealand is not doing that bad in that in the first line, which is uh, 0.4 kilowatt. I mean, comparison to Australia and all that, but there are, there are, there are, uh, you know, um, you know, nations where there are a lot of capacity per EV and that shows that they may not have a sufficient, um, you know, facilities to charge at home. But they, that also shows that there may be something the EV demand is growing and the number of charges will grow. And this has to come to a point where there will be a lot of public charging facility required. Now, anyway, this I'll skip, but this there is a global electric uh, you know, electric vehicle initiative. I just wanted to let you know that um, both UK and New Zealand are part of it. Um, and uh, just to see a few market very quickly, uh, UK itself, you know, we are seeing, you know, the new car sales is around 20% plus. Look, I don't there is a distinction at the moment that they are plug-in or plug-less vehicles or BEV. This distinction is only uh, for time being that uh, you know, the prices are coming to their break point. But consider them that they are non-IC. Um, uh, the, so they will all become the electric vehicle thing. So it is like 20%. In Australia, Australia is slower, uh, but it had jumped the new car sales to around 7.4%, uh, you know, compared to the 1.8 or 2% uh, earlier. So it is exponentially growing. There's no doubt about it. Singapore sales, you know, recently, you know, 13% new car sales, uh, EVs. So why I'm trying to say is that this is a global trend and uh, New Zealand is definitely, you know, uh, going the same way or much faster than probably uh, New Zealand, if we see, uh, there are, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten percent, you know, electric vehicles, but there are a big portion of hybrid, which will future will convert into EV. So there's a big percentage of basically, you know, going towards the electrification. Um, and the recent you know, numbers I got, you know, this uh, it confirms the trend, what Peter was saying, that there is a trend for EV market growing globally and in New Zealand, and that will require us to think about the efficient charging infrastructure. And uh, I mean, this, there are some data, basic, basically it says that now if there is a EVs and there are so many charges required, the electric network has to prepare itself to provide the needs of charging EVs. And that means how can we optimize or how can we use the existing network to full? Uh, so that that will take us to you know placing the EV charges where network capacity is available and charging EVs when the network capacity is available. So basically, uh, two things: the placement of public charges and the charging time timings. Uh, both will decide how efficiently we can use the existing network and minimize uh, the uh, network um, uh, 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 development further. Um, this is just, uh, I'm saying that, you know, in terms of the New Zealand, uh, Peter mentioned the EECA, they're part of the Plexstock project also, and they, they, they are working on this all private charging, public destination charging and journey charging. And uh, basically their observation is also that using a smart EV charges at home is the first priority. But then there is um, low emission transport funds, which already have co-funded 1300 charges across the country. And which is, which means a charger every 75 kilometers. Um, so this is, this is a good statistics for us that how every kilometers, you know, the journey char charges are coming and how the networks are going to cope with that. I now hand over to Ian uh, to present from the EA Technology UK. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Yogendra. It is a pleasure to be speaking to you today to share about our learning from working on Innovation Project Charge with SP Energy Networks in the UK. So charge was 
all about public electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Where was it likely to be needed and where was their grid capacity for it? If you can present these two pieces of information to people who are seeking to install chargers, then you have a treasure map of the best locations. For areas where there isn't available grid capacity, the project assessed smart charging flexible connections as a means of getting more EV chargers connected more quickly and at lower cost. Charge built on previous research and demonstration projects that have covered off-street EV charging. At EA Technology, we've been involved in projects in this space for about 12 to 13 years, working with several clients to identify and understand EV charging demand profiles, diversity factors, and customer behaviors. This project was a development and demonstration project bound within SP Energy Network's Merseyside and North Wales area, Manweb or SPM, uh, which has about 1.5 million connected customers. The charge consisted of three main parts, each with a main project partner delivering the work, and all of them reporting to SP Energy Networks as the project lead. So the, the graphic which will appear up on the screen in a moment uh, shows the different components of charge and how they're developed and integrated within the project. There we go. So for, for part one or method one of the charge project, PTV Group have modelled the entirety of the Manweb license area that's covered by the project using their PTV VISM software. They identified the EV energy requirements for each small geographic area called LSOA or lower layer super output area in the UK for three use cases, public destination, residential and workplace charging. The charging in these locations varies from seven kilowatts for residential up to about 50 kilowatts for some destination locations. The fourth use case, en route charging is presented per road section. And the charging here was estimated to be between 50 and 300 kilowatts. So the requirement for EV charging is growing and likely to have doubled uh, across 2021 to, to 2023 in the UK. Uh, and it's forecast to continue growing. So faster than new capacity is physically being added to the network. And w this growth alongside other electrification for decarbonisation is likely to increase demand greater than the utilities can build the network. So I don't know if this matches your experience or, or what you're anticipating in, in New Zealand. And we'd love to, to hear more about what you're seeing. So how do network companies handle this? Uh, the approach for, for other forms of demand or generation in the UK has been to use flexibility. Smarter grid solutions delivered part two, method two of charge to consider the potential flexibility from smart charging connections. They have developed a specification for determining whether customers can be offered a smart charging solution and conducted some virtual trials to assess how this might work in practice. The original intention was to physically trial these different approaches. However, COVID happened and the required level of customer, of customer engagement to do a full trial was, was no longer possible. So at uh, EA Technology, we have built Connect More Tool, um, so part three, method three of the charge project. Uh, using detailed asset data provided by SP Energy Networks, we modeled the load on the network to a high level of granularity, determining the highest load likely to be experienced by any asset on the network. This is a modeled, not a monitored approach, using typical demand profiles for the connected customers and a statistical approach to the diversity of consumption found in typical networks. We also codified the network build costs so that we can provide an accurate estimate of the cost to connect in each location. Combining this in the heat map with the EV charging demand from the PTV group and presenting it in a customer facing web portal allows users to determine their best locations for positioning charge points and connecting to the network. So what did we learn from the transport model and the smart charging? Uh, work within the charge project. Let's look at the, the transport model first. So I'm presenting the results here for the four scenarios that we studied for 2030, looking at high, 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 
high low, low high and low low relating to EV uptake and the availability of public charging infrastructure. The biggest point uh, that we learned was that there is a huge potential range in electrical demand from EV charging certainly as you transition between now and 2050. The question generally is not, will it come, but when will it come and how will we cope along that journey? So here the difference just for this manweb area, you can see potentially between 500 megawatt hours per day up to about three gigawatt hours per day. Uh, but in all cases, the largest demand is expected from off-street residential charging, people with driveways. There are many factors uh, for this convenience, um, price of energy, how energy is taxed. So in, in the UK, uh, energy at home is taxed at 5%. Um, commercial, energy, uh, commercial sale of electricity through a charge point is uh, taxed at 20%. Uh, and various other nuances that make it generally better for the user uh, to be able to charge at home if they can. Uh, we also notice, noted that the presence of good EV charging infrastructure incentivizes the EV uptake in a small way. Um, increasing both the home and public charging demand. Effectively, if you can reduce the, uh, the, the range anxiety that people have by providing good infrastructure, um, more people are likely to buy an electric car. So this analysis was carried out in 2021, looking nine years ahead. And I think it's clear that as, as we get nearer to the time, the particular scenario that we're following will become more clear, uh, allowing network planning to be made cater for the demand increase with greater confidence. And if you want to look into these results in more detail, please uh, follow the link on the slide or, or search for SP Energy Network's charge project. A lot of the, the learning that we've developed over the course of the project is available there in, in the reports on the web page. So what did we learn about the smart charging connections? from the work there. Well, let's look first at the types of smart charging connection that we um, that we explored. So the first two are customer-led and then the second two are utility-led. So the time-constrained connection schemes. In this case, the connection agreement between the charge point operator and the network specifies a different amount of capacity at different times i.e. if it's a, in a residential area, it might allow a higher consumption overnight when most of the domestic load is off and the network utilization is lower. This is a very simple approach, which is liked by customers and allows more capacity to be used at certain times. But looking ahead, it could potentially be less flexible to changes over time and is quite dependent on the load profile of the, the area and the location of the charge point. The second, customer load management schemes are already commonplace in the UK. And it's hit the press a few times, but if any of you with an EV charger have been to a busy en route charging station and not been able to charge at full power, you will see the effect of this. Um, so certainly it's beneficial for them to be able to install more chargers at a location than necessarily they can operate at maximum output at any point in time. Uh, and they have a, a charge control software on site to, to be able to keep the aggregate level below the agreed threshold. The third is locally managed constraint schemes. So this is network led active control scheme where you have a, a single network constraint. It may be local to or remote from the, uh, the, the charging location that where the, uh, but the network operator uh, would install some monitoring equipment at the location of the constraint. Um, and instruct, uh, use a point-to-point -point communication to instruct uh, the charge point to reduce when the constraint is reached. Uh, this is relatively simple to implement uh, compared to a, a centrally managed constraint scheme uh, in a situation where the network operator has either an ANM or active network management system or a distributed energy resource management system uh, connected within, within their, their software systems they can then manage multiple network constraints uh, and send control signals directly to demand generation sites to avoid sections of the network being overloaded. Uh, I have to say really impressed to see the work on the FlexTalk project, actually getting a, a, an industry standard uh, communication protocol for this uh, across the country will be really, really beneficial, I think, to you uh, in terms of being able to deploy solutions like this uh, in the future. 
it should be noted that none of these would actually stop the charge point operator reducing their charge rates in response to other utility service markets, the spot price on the electricity market, for instance. Um, and, the, and there may be other reasons why why charging is is reduced. I should also note that although we built the capacity to the capability to advise customers of the smart charging connection possibilities, SP Energy Networks requested that we didn't make the functionality live because they've not carried out the other business change activities necessary to deploy these as business as usual. So as I can see from the work that's going on that you're well aware of the need to develop end-to-end -end solutions to be able to do flexibility uh, in this. And again, more detail is available on in the reports on the website, particularly the charge point, public charge point flexibility insight report. So let's uh, look now at Connect More uh, in a little more detail. So the videos in the next three slides are going to show you some of the functionality within Connect More. It is available live online. So search for SP Energy Networks Charge project or, or use the link shown. So this video shows the EV charging demand on the heat map. So first, the user must select the type of charging requirements they want to look at, so public destination, residential, etc. Um, and then the user defines the scenario of interest, a high or low uptake or, or charging capability, and, and the time horizon uh, within five-year intervals from 2025 through to 2050. Most of the data is then displayed by uh, LSOA for the whole of the SP Energy Network's ManWeb license area and selecting any of these areas will give you all of the data associated with that area, specifically for the, so apologies, give the forecast charging data associated with that area for the scenario and the year selected. Um, all of the variables that show up on the, the right-hand side toolbar uh, can be exported out of the tool uh, if required. So switching to the electricity network capacity section of the heat map, the user can decide whether to look at LV or HV capacity, depending on the network configuration and the size of the potential EV charging connection being investigated. Selecting the LV network, you can see that when the assets are displayed, there are a lot of substations, uh, 12,480 secondary subs approximately in the ManWeb license area, and you can zoom in to display individual cable and overhead line circuits. The network assets are color coded based on the capacity modeling results built using data on the installed assets uh, and the type, number and location of connected customers. A green asset has sufficient remaining capacity to add the uh, requested new connection and then leave plenty of further capacity. Orange uh, has capacity for the new connection but then limited spare capacity afterwards and a red asset has insufficient capacity for the new connection. Using a small village near, near our office, uh, as an example, we can, when the video comes back around to it, uh, you'll be able to see that the, there we go, that the, the main street has no further capacity even for 25 kVA. And as you step up through the different capacities, uh, the surrounding circuits uh, available capacity is steadily used up with a little bit remaining in the transformers, albeit a reduced level. This approach is replicated for the HV network just with higher connection capacity values uh, reflecting the high voltage connection and you can of course overlay the electric vehicle charging demand on the screen and uh, see where these two map together, the treasure map as it were. So the next video that I'd like to show you um, shows the user gen journey for someone who is seeking an estimated cost for a connection using the tool. Um, it is embedded within SP Energy Network's website um, and starts with a disclaimer using all the appropriate legal information that this is an, an estimate uh, and not uh, an acceptable quote um, in legal terms. And then follow the process through, identify the uh, area where they'd like to connect a load, confirm the total capacity that they require, selecting the precise location for the new connection on the map, and then draw the cable route and the point of connection to the existing network. This enables the tool to provide a budgetary estimate for the connection, 
uh, covering all the necessary work required, including network reinforcement if relevant. And should the customer be optioneering, trying to find the cheapest location or locations in any area, they can simply start the process all over again. Um, and they can they can test that. Our UK clients have seen that some charge point installers seeking to install perhaps four or five chargers in a town are putting in maybe 50 to 100 connection applications just to find the best prices, best locations to connect. Clearly, this is not efficient for the utility, for the network operator, um, as the vast majority of this work is purely speculative. Uh, this video is a, a live screen recording of the someone following through the process. There, there's no, some steps have been removed or the sequence has been shortened. Uh, so it gives you a view of how, how quick it, it is as a process and it is live online. So if you want to try it, you're welcome to pretend that you are at our office uh, near Chester or perhaps Liverpool or Wrexham football clubs or somewhere else in the Merseyside and, and North Wales area. So where do smart charging flexible connections come into the process? Well, the work from Smart Grid Solutions is included in the cost estimator tool. So where the network does not have sufficient capacity for the planned connection, Connect More considers where a flexible connection can be offered. Looking at the example on this slide, the model showing wind to peak command on the network is subtracted from the maximum uh, capacity or the, the equipment ratings at the point of connection through, and this gives you an available capacity profile. I won't give the details of, of the actual costs here, but you can see that if the, the applicant were able to reduce their, their uh, consumption to 189 kVA as a flat demand, uh, they could uh, connect without reinforcement. If they wish for a little bit more than that, a, a timed or a profile connection, they could, they could have more capacity overnight. Um, it's available within, within the network. And if you're looking at live or real time control, then uh, you you would get more most of the year because this is modeling a, a, a worst case winter scenario. So before we, we close, um, I'd like to take you through what has happened next. Um, uh, but before that, I'd like us to share a few words from the license director for ManWeb at SP Energy Networks, Liam O'Sullivan. The CHARGE project has successfully delivered new and innovative ways for the UK to create a public charging infrastructure that both supports all EV drivers now and in the future. It's provided a vital insight into EV driving patterns and charge point demand over the next 25 years. It's also developed smart connection solutions that can maximise the use of existing network capacity and rapidly boost the number of public charge points. It's empowered stakeholders with a time-saving self-service online tool that takes the complexity out of charge point location and provides instant connection quotes. We're incredibly proud of the CHARGE project's achievements and the way in which SP Energy Networks and its partners have worked together to produce a roadmap for the next phase of public charge point deployment. We hope that the new tools and methodologies we've developed will be used by the industry as a part of its business as usual activities going forward. Whether in the deployment of flexible connections or in improving DNO's customer service. Thank you, Liam. Um, and a, so charge officially finished at the end of December 2022 and is now completing a transition into business as usual. Uh, what happened? Okay. So what is happening here hopefully will give you some insight as to where the UK network operators are going and seeing value in the learnings from the project. So firstly, the network operators are not tending to roll out transport models specifically, um, but are making forecasts and data available regarding uh, multiple types of low carbon technology or LCT, often as part of distribution future energy scenarios work. This includes estimations of the uptake of EVs, heat pumps, solar, and so on, forecast through to 2050. Secondly, flexible and smart charging connections continue to be developed across the UK with many networks adopting a flexibility first approach, 
using the existing capacity rather than building new infrastructure where possible. And this includes for uh, EV charging connections. And thirdly, using heat maps and making data available through GIS tools is very popular in the UK. Um, we see most utilities now having some system that presents relevant data in this way. There's a large regulatory pressure in the UK for network data to be presumed open, with more and more data sets uh, being made available all the time. Uh, and finally, we are seeing a move towards self-service connections cost estimates. In the UK, about 86% of, of the networks have these in place now or in development, uh, mostly are using our technology. Um, we currently have this live for several clients covering about 250, well, 275,000 secondary substations, serving about half of, of Britain. And working with our clients, we continue to innovate and push the capabilities in this area. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Yugendra now, who will talk through how this might uh, apply in New Zealand. everyone just quickly that all this insight uh, will definitely be useful for australia and new zealand uh, in particular the insights insights for the transport planning which is which is very important the transport planning uh, insights are like understanding the load profiles, which is where the things will be used most. And uh, then there is a visibility of the electricity network, the heat maps. Uh, both these things that knowing where the EVs, hot points or hot spots are going to be, how the traffic behavior and the, you know, the EV profile is going to be, and where the capacity is available or is going to be, uh, demanded those things will equally be useful in New Zealand and even for Australia I'd say and then the, Ian was talking about the flexible connections uh, depending on the demand and depending on the uh, you know charge point requirements uh, it will be interesting to see whether there will be a there will be a flexible uh, connection opportunity uh, for these charge points and I would like to here that this is the beginning of for the especially for the electricity networks to start having their capacities mapped in some form on some shape and then tomorrow we bring the monitored data and we all travel towards the very dynamic uh, you know hosting capacities or operating envelopes and the similar thought of uh, sort of things were actually echoed by ev council australia uh, they are definitely, you know, supporting the DNSPs to improve LV network visibility uh, for internal use um, going forward. So there's another thing is that if any EDV wants to have one one-on-one -on -one Q and A and demo sessions of a charge project, uh, please contact me or Ian, and we can definitely organize that to happen. Um, and then we can probably go into more details uh, for you. And I will now hand over to Peter. Peter, there is one question before you, you close the thing. Is saying any plans to implement similar platforms in New Zealand? So I don't know whether you want to uh, respond to that and then you know close this webinar. Yeah, thanks, Yugendra. Yeah, look, um, um, we're a, an organization that collaborates across the industry. So if the industry needs it, we'll be there to, to help and support them. Um, so, uh, so open to, to consideration of all of these things. Uh, certainly, the Open ADR Flex Talk project has been a significant piece of work um, for us. Um, so, we're really looking now at the uh, implications of it. What else needs to be collectively looked at across the industry? So, yeah, open to open to thoughts and suggestions from the audience here as to what they see the priorities as, as being going forward. So great question. Look, um, Ian and uh, Yugendra, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, certainly there's a lot that we can learn from what's going on overseas. 
Uh, I know from experience that, that the industry is not the only one monitoring what goes on overseas. There are regulators doing the same thing and asking the question, why can't we do these things in New Zealand? I think what you've highlighted is uh, the fact that uh, it is going to be a challenge for, for, for everybody in terms of, of integrating um, demand response and managing demand response into, into existing networks. Um, I think the customer is key. Customers are, are setting quite high expectations already. Uh, as I say, they see things overseas and go, why can't we do that in New Zealand? So um, can I just say thank you very much for giving us an overview of the challenges that you faced in the UK and the solutions they've come up with. I mean, the challenge for us is around what do we take out of this? How do we, how do we apply that in New Zealand? So really good learnings for us. Can I just also acknowledge and thank the um, EA team and the EA technology team in terms of putting this presentation together. Uh, we've been operating in different time zones, so I know what a struggle it is. So thanks to Callista, um, to uh, Neil and to, to the EA team, um, and thanks to my team at the EA. And a particular thanks to the FlexTalk team. Part of what the FlexTalk team is not just focusing on the problems that we are uh, and the challenges around uh, communications protocols. We're also thinking about what else is going to occur and how uh, we can bring those learnings to, to an audience. So it was really the Flex Talk team that put these thoughts together. And, uh, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Connie Dunbar and to, uh, and to Stuart Johnson for, for their work and helping to put this um, together. Um, before we close, as I said before, we've got part B, uh, sorry, part A uh, report is uh, in prep at the moment, and we're hoping to have that available in November, uh, sorry, October, and we've got part B underway at the moment, and that report will be due in February. So lots more work to be done, lots more discussion to go on around FlexTalk. So look, that's it from me. You can get back a minute of your life by us signing off early. But thanks so much to all the presenters and thanks so much for all of you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your morning, evening, uh, afternoon, wherever you may be. So thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.